Jesus was not without his friends among the religious Sanhedrin. The night encounter with Nicodemus confirmed this fact. Nicodemus came as an emissary of a group of Jewish elders who sought to understand the person and ministry of this new controversial rabbi. The appearance of Nicodemus revealed one thing. The Sanhedrin was not united in their opinion of Jesus Christ. There must have been growing dissatisfaction with their old religious ways. No doubt, the ministry of John the Baptist reached from the Jordan River to the hallowed halls of the temple in Jerusalem and the great Sanhedrin. John prepared the way for Jesus Christ, the Messiah, into the hearts of open-minded rabbis and into the hearts of the nation. The doctrine being preached by Jesus Christ rattled Jewish religious dogma to the core. How is it possible that a man must be born again? Why does Jesus expect us, the religious elite, to endure the humiliation of ceremonial religious baptism reserved only for pagan proselytes? We are the children of the kingdom because of our relationship to Abraham and Moses. Why do we have to become like little children in order to enter God's kingdom? My bloodline is my guarantee. Why didn't the Sanhedrin accept the teachings of Jesus? There can be only one possible conclusion. The doctrines of Jesus did not conform to the current theology being taught in the synagogues of Jerusalem. Since Jesus did not accept their doctrine, he did not accept their authority. By not accepting the authority of the Sanhedrin, the religious elite could not control him. After the Passover and the encounter with Nicodemus, Jesus and his disciples tarried in Judea at the Jordan River, baptizing many converts. But John was also baptizing those who responded to his message. It must be understood that Jesus did not baptize his converts with water, but his disciples did the water baptism. The true spiritual baptism of Jesus is not with water, it's with fire. The water baptism conducted by the disciples of Jesus identified his converts with John's water baptism of repentance. Scripture is clear. The message of Jesus and John was the same. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It should be noted that the Pharisees also thought the ministries of Jesus and John were a dual manifestation of the same ministry. Since the Pharisees believed the ministries of Jesus and John were the same, they could use this observation to their advantage, because a house divided against itself cannot stand. With this in mind, the Pharisees sought to sow discord among the disciples of Jesus and John. The first thing the Pharisees did was to plant doubt with the disciples of John. They did not challenge Jesus or John, but they questioned their disciples about their biblical authority to baptize. The scriptural context implies that the Pharisees mocked the disciples of John concerning the greater following of Jesus. John's disciples returned, challenging the ministry of Jesus, their passions inflamed by jealousy and envy implanted by the Pharisees. John rebuked his disciples by stating, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. John emphatically stated that Jesus' ministry was from heaven and that he was only the forerunner of the Messiah. Apparently, John's disciples wanted to believe that he was the Messiah but John reminded them that he was not. John's humility comes through loud and clear in verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. John knew that he must decrease in order for the ministry of Christ to increase. John understood that there was to be no competition 
between the two ministries. His day was over. It appears that John felt no jealousy towards Jesus, because jealousy finds its source in pride. How true the words of John were. Shortly after this encounter, John was captured and sent to prison. Jesus left Judea for Galilee to begin his preaching ministry there. The context of this portion of John's Gospel indicates that Jesus' departure was linked to the discord of the Pharisees and John's imprisonment. After the arrest of John by Herod, Jesus left Judea to begin his preaching ministry in the region of Galilee. The reasons are many for the departure of Jesus from Judea. He may have left due to the conflict with John's disciples, or maybe Herod's imprisonment of John. The scripture is not clear, but one thing is clear. Jesus was compelled by the Holy Spirit to journey through Samaria in order to reach Galilee. John 4.4 4 emphatically states that Jesus had to go through Samaria. There were three main routes used by pilgrims in that day to journey from Galilee to Jerusalem for the Holy Feasts. There was the coastal route, and a caravan route through Perea along the eastern bank of the Jordan River. The Jordan caravan route was the preferred path from Galilee to Judea because of its moderate terrain. The third route did lead through Samaria, but it was physically arduous and plagued with bandits. Josephus does reference the fact that travelers occasionally did use this route. For centuries, the citizens of Samaria and Judea despised each other, and occasionally open hostility broke out between them. Both regions worshiped the same God, and each revered the law of Moses, but they rejected their places of worship. To the Jewish nation, the main center of worship was Jerusalem and the Holy Temple of Herod, while to the Samaritans, Mount Gerizim was the center of worship. Sychar was located at the foot of this mountain. Samaria was also the seat of idolatry during the period of the divided kingdom. The Greeks and Romans also used Samaria as a relocation region for Gentile refugees, and their cultural amalgamation resulted in a corrupt form of Judaism. Rabbinic thought through this time period believed that contact with Samaritans caused one to become ceremonially unclean. Considering all the cultural and religious hostilities Jews had towards Samaritans, why would Jesus be compelled by the Holy Spirit to journey through this region? Maybe he had a divine appointment with a woman at a well in the small town of Sychar. John chapter 4, verse 4 through 9. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. It was during this rest period that Jesus encountered the woman at the well and offered to her the promise of Israel, living water. According to Pharisaical doctrine, the Samaritans were the hated of the Lord, worthy only for destruction. The Pharisees also taught that contact with a Samaritan would ceremonially defile a religious Jew since they were considered unclean. When the disciples witnessed Jesus in conversation with the Samaritan woman, they marveled and were challenged by their understanding of this pharisaical repulsion. It was during this discourse with the woman at the well that Jesus admitted his messianic ministry. 
It is rare in scripture for Christ to admit his messianic ministry since the Jewish religious system was so hard of heart. John chapter four, verse 25 and 26. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Jesus dwelt with the Samaritans for two days because of their warm reception and faith. John records that many Samaritans in the city of Sychar believed in Jesus because of his teachings. It's interesting to note that the Samaritans did not require signs and wonders to believe the message of Christ. At this very point, the Jewish religious system stumbled in unbelief, but the Samaritans responded in faith. John chapter 4 verse 42 they said to the woman we no longer believe just because of what you said now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world the spiritual insight into Christ's teachings by the Samaritans was amazing they understood that the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ would be worldwide and not restricted to the Jews only this concept was insightful and revolutionary for the religious and political world of Israel during the days of Jesus. Matthew records that Christ's first stop in Galilee after leaving Samaria was Nazareth. All that is recorded of this event is that Jesus left this town. Why? Luke in his gospel expands on this event and provides clarity. What was the issue that caused the Nazarenes to break fellowship with Jesus? On the Sabbath day, Jesus stood in the synagogue and turned in the scroll of Isaiah the prophet to the famous messianic quote found in Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 and 2. Jesus read, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Luke's rendition of Jesus reading Isaiah 61 is not quite the same as the reference in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Isaiah 61 does not make reference to the opening of blind eyes. Did Jesus make a mistake, or did Luke misquote Jesus? The answer to the question is simple. Neither made a mistake. Jesus read from two references in the scroll of Isaiah. He combined Isaiah 42 verse 1 and 7 with Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah 42 verse 1 and verse 7. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my elect, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Jesus rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the rabbi and said, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. This simple phrase is all that was necessary to start a riot because Jesus clearly indicated that he was the fulfillment of this messianic promise. Jesus told his audience that he was the Messiah. Luke chapter 4 verse 22 through 30 Is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, You shall surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. 
whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarpa, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elias the prophet, and none of them was cleansed save Naaman the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, was filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him unto the bow of the hill, whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. No doubt, familiarity breeds contempt. The Nazarenes knew Jesus and his family. There was no way he could be the Messiah. Mark and Luke both state that Jesus could not do any miracles in Nazareth except for laying his hands on a few sick people and healing them due to their lack of faith. The Gospels allude to the fact that Jesus did not return to Nazareth during his Galilean ministry. The actions of the Nazarenes caused them to lose out on the greatest gift of all, the gift of Jesus. Since the hometown of Jesus would not receive his ministry, he journeyed to Capernaum and taught in their synagogues on the Sabbath days. People were astonished at Jesus' doctrine, for his word was with power. Why all the excitement with the preaching of Jesus? This would not be the first time the Jewish common folk heard preaching from the Torah. Two reasons immediately come to mind. The first reason is very pragmatic. Jesus taught in a simple fashion that allowed the common people to understand his message. The reason why the people were astonished by the preaching of Jesus is that they understood his message. This simple principle leads us to the second reason. Jesus did not teach like the scribes and Pharisees who debated with each other by quoting the ancient rabbis who compared teacher with teacher. Jesus shared the truth of God in a clear and simple fashion. He did not yield to endless theological debate. Jesus was a great communicator because he used the KISS method. The doctrine of Jesus was not filled with debate. It came with power and authority. The casting out of the demon in the synagogue was validation of Jesus' ministry. The people commented, What new doctrine is this? For with authority commands he even the unclean spirits and they obey him. During the early days of the Capernaum ministry, the gospel narrative indicates that Jesus used Peter's house as a base of operation. Peter's mother-in-law, the main host, was severely sick with a great fever. How can you carry on operations when the chief cook and bottle washer is out of action? Jesus responded to the emergency by healing Peter's mother-in-law. The Gospel narrative on two separate occasions records the fact that the touch of Jesus healed fever. We see the mother-in-law of Peter being healed and the son of a nobleman from Cana. We may read these events and not give thought to the kind of fever infecting these two individuals. But both persons were from the Galilean region, and this is significant. The shores of the Sea of Galilee raged with the malaria. And in the summer, the region is known to be unhealthy still today. It's entirely possible that the great fever assaulting Peter's mother-in-law was malaria. We know from John's Gospel that Simon Peter had a brief interlude with Jesus at the Jordan River in the early days of the Judean ministry. No doubt this encounter had an impact on Peter, but more was needed. He was not ready to submit his life to a new itinerant preacher related to John the Baptist. 
Simon Peter was a rash, impetuous man who would not give his loyalty easily. He was a fisherman who did not follow fledgling prophets like his brother Andrew, who chased after the ministry of John the Baptist. According to Matthew's Gospel, it was during this teaching tour of Galilee that a divine appointment occurred between Jesus and Simon Peter. Andrew and John were the only disciples who followed Christ during the first Judean Passover ministry. This is the reason John's Gospel is the only record of these incidents. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were not part of this experience. According to the historical record, it was foolish to fish during the day because the fish would only rise at night to feed. The fishing industry on the Lake of Galilee was a night business only. This point must be understood. Luke chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. One day, as Jesus was standing by the Lake of Gethsemane with the people crowding around him and listening to the Word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I'll let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that the nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. For he and his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken, and so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid, from now on you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. It took this miracle to finally cause Simon Peter, Andrew, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, to make the final commitment to leave everything and follow Jesus. Jesus and his new disciples went throughout Galilee and Samaria, demonstrating his authority over all creation by the miracles he performed. These signs were designated to authenticate his mission and his teaching. it would be easy to form the impression that these disciples left their families and fishing business to follow Jesus at their first encounter. But this is not the case. At least two of the disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, and John, the son of Zebedee and brother to James, were disciples to John the Baptist. Peter was exposed to Jesus at the Jordan River along with his brother Andrew. What was Peter doing at the Jordan River with his brother Andrew? No doubt, Peter was also seeking the word of the Lord from the preaching of John the Baptist. The decision made by these disciples to follow Jesus was not rash, impulsive action, but a decision made by thought and prayer. Since Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law, no doubt Peter's wife was also part of the decision-making process. When we harmonize the Gospels, it should be clear that the decision by the Apostles to follow Jesus was conscientious, not impetuous. Rabbinic doctrine traced all disease to moral causes. Rabbinic writing from this time period taught that there was no death without sin and no pain without transgression. The sick is not healed till all sins are forgiven him. Leprosy was seen as a direct stroke from God, and this disease was believed to be divine retribution for slander. During Jesus' preaching tour of Galilee, 
great multitudes followed him in order to hear the doctrine he taught. A leper came and fell before Jesus, worshiping him, and said, Lord, if thou wilt, thou can make me clean. Rabbinic doctrine taught that this leper was cursed and totally contaminated, and any form of contact would result in ceremonial defilement. Jesus responded to this religious tradition by reaching out to this leper, contrary to Jewish tradition and doctrine. He touched him with mercy, compassion, and power, not theological dogma, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. The rumors of the miraculous powers found in this itinerant preacher from Nazareth spread throughout the whole region of Galilee and even reached Jerusalem. Crowds came looking for Jesus with their sick and dying while he traveled through Galilee preaching in their synagogues. During this brief traveling interlude, Jesus continually demonstrated his authority over the kingdom of darkness by casting out devils wherever he found them. When Jesus returned to Capernaum, he returned to his home base of Peter's house. Large crowds followed him and filled Peter's house to overflowing capacity. The crowds spilled over even onto the roof of the house in order to hear Jesus preach in the courtyard. The audience was filled with Pharisees and the doctors of the law from every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. The crowd was great, and the friends of a paralytic sought to bring their friend to Jesus, but they could not reach him because of the large crowds. In a response of faith, the friends of the paralytic lowered him down through the ceiling tile in front of Jesus. Jesus understood the mixed crowd, and he understood the Jewish dogma that taught that disease is the result of sin. Jesus, in response to an act of faith and to confront the doctrine of the Pharisees, said, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. This statement caused the Pharisees and the doctors to fume with anger, because only God could forgive sin. By this statement, Jesus made himself equal with God. What type of forgiveness was recorded in the Old Testament? According to prevailing doctrine, none. Sin was only covered, not forgiven. This was the controversy that inflamed the Pharisees and the doctors of the law. The healing of the paralytic caused considerable controversy among the established religious order because Jesus associated his healing power with the authority to forgive sins. How could this be? Only the blood of the Paschal Lamb could cover the sins of men. The controversy surrounding Jesus only inflamed and spread among the Pharisees and the doctors of the law. No doubt Jesus challenged the accepted religious theology of his day. Levi was a custom house official who was a tax collector. The correct name of the tax collector is Gabai, whose primary responsibility was to collect regular real estate income and pool taxes. The custom house official was called Moker, whose duty was to collect imports, exports, tolls on roads, bridges and harbors, and town taxes. The position of the tax collector was awarded by bid on contract. Therefore, Levi was under great financial obligation to Rome. A tax collector's payment was the excess taxes he could collect that were not required by Rome. In simple terms, a good tax collector was a good extortionist and thief. Levi had a lucrative contract with Rome, yet the Bible says he left all at the call of Jesus. No doubt Levi was pricked to the core of his heart by the preaching of Jesus and he understood that he was a sinner. When given an opportunity to repent, Levi left all to follow Jesus. The call of Levi inflamed Jesus' disciples and the Pharisees, whose doctrine of righteousness did not offer redemption to tax collectors. Jesus made it clear that he did not come to call the righteous to repentance. His mission was to call sinners to repent. 
Let's put this concept into perspective. Righteousness in the Jewish religious order was determined by ancestral descent from Abraham and adherence to the tradition of the Pharisees. As long as the Pharisees could control the concept of righteousness, they could control the people. Matthew chapter 9, verse 11 through 13. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why eat your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye, and learn what that means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The most important element of repentance is the acknowledgement of sin. The Pharisees did not believe they were in need of repentance, therefore they had no need of a physician. The message of Jesus would be ignored by the Pharisees because of their self-imposed righteousness. Those who acknowledge their sin and their personal need for repentance receive the message of Jesus. Through the remaining months of Jesus' Galilean mission, the remaining 12 apostles were assembled. The number 12 is significant because of its reference to the 12 tribes of Israel. It was common for Jewish religious groups to form governments based on the number 12. This is especially noted among the ASEAN desert communities like Koram and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Final list of the 12 apostles is Simon Peter, also known as Cephas and Barjona, Andrew, John, Philip, James, Bartholomew, also believed to be the same as Nathaniel, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Matthew, also known as Levi, Simon the Zealot, who was probably a member of the revolutionary sect of Zealots, Judas, also known as Thaddeus, James the Less, the son of Alphaeus and Mary, the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. It is so easy to look into the Bible and see the disciples of Jesus Christ as men and women of great spiritual faith and insight. We could visualize these simple people as great religious superheroes of the faith. From Peter, Paul, James and John, to Mary Magdalene, to even the wives of the first apostles, we could stand in awe of their faith and testimony. Should we do this? we miss the real truth and testimony of their lives. These men and women are flesh and blood and bone, just as we are. They experience the same passions, dreams, frustrations and difficulties that we do. They live lives the same as we do, but they allowed their lives to touch the world they lived in. Jesus called his first disciples to carry the good news around the world, and they succeeded in their mission. The message and the call have not changed. The good news must be carried around the world. Each generation must win the battle for the souls of men anew. Each generation must carry the message to a lost and dying world. The questions that confront us all are simple. These are the same questions that confronted Peter at the Sea of Galilee and Paul on the Damascus Road. Will we complete the mission set before us? Will we run the race of our faith with honor and compassion? Will we become fishers of men? Will we be true disciples of Jesus Christ? What epitaphs will be seen on our tombstone?